I want to thank you all very much for having me here today. Um, I've been a member of the uh, medical staff here for 18 years. I've uh, wanted to, I really, uh, I would like to say, I'd like to thank everybody who's here to hear me talk, but I know everybody's here for the food. And somewhere out there, somewhere out there, someone's wearing a shirt that says, I'm only here for the food. I know that. Uh, but anyway, I want to talk to you about what's happening in, in pulmonary medicine because it's very exciting things that are going on now. If really, if you've been out of fellowship, out of a training, whatever training you went to, for even just a couple, a few years, you don't know what we're doing in pulmonary medicine because it's become uh, very specialized. Uh, some of the things we're doing are cutting edge, and it's really, really very exciting to me. Um, so let's. So what am I doing here? Basically, I want to tell you a little story about why I am where I am right now. About four years ago, three or four years ago, I went to a, there was some new technology that was coming out called navigational bronchoscopy. Actually, it came out about 10 years ago. And I went to a meeting at MD Anderson, and they were talking about this new technology, GPS technology, and, and, I, and it was, looked like it was very cumbersome. And I, and I talked to the people there. I said, why do we need navigational bronchoscopy in a place like Austin, Texas? We have people we need to take care of anything. And it really was too cumbersome, and I really decided we weren't ready for that yet. And then about three or four years ago, they came to us. The technology was better. The equipment was better. So I went to a conference out in Arizona, and I, and I went there to learn about bronchoscopy, to see how, how I could do this new bronchoscopy. When I got there, what I realized was there's a whole lot more to doing a bronchoscopy than just doing the procedure. Because we're doing bronchoscopies to look at, to di help diagnose cancer. And that's what the focus of this conference was about, cancer diagnosis and the treatment of cancer and what's, what's going on there. And so as I sat there and listened to this talk, I realized that, so I did, while I came here to be a, learn how to be a better bronchoscopist, I really, what I left there was thinking, there are gaps in the medical system here in Austin, Texas, relating to thoracic oncology, that maybe we could go back and make a difference. And that's why I'm, so part of the reason I'm here is to educate the, some of the medical community about what we're able to do now uh, what's, what's, what the new technology is to help elevate the conversation about uh, lung cancer, thoracic oncology in general, so people know when we start talking about genetic mutations, what does that mean? When we start talking about, uh, you know, uh, mesonoscopies, uh, lymphadenopathy, how do we get to these things? How do we diagnose these things? And then to coordinate, to help uh, bring people in for the medical uh, multidisciplinary cancer conferences, to get people together, to help the medical oncologists talk to the pulmonologists, talk to the thoracic surgeons, and get everybody to talk more about these things so we can sit together and decide what's the best therapy for our patients. So lung cancer. Basically, there are over 200,000 cases of lung cancer in the United States a year, newly diagnosed cases. It's the number one cause of cancer-related death in the United States. And, and you all can all read this. It kills more people than all the other, these other cancers combined. And, uh, that uh, most of them are related to, to tobacco usage. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of people still suffering from lung cancer. We haven't had the advances in lung cancer that we've had in other cancers, but I think we're getting there very rapidly. Things are changing rapidly. And this is not meant to be a lung cancer talk. I'm not going to be an all-encompassing talk. I'm just uh, introducing this stuff so we can get on to the, what I want to talk about. So everybody's seen this before. Everybody remembers going to the doctor and you know, when you were younger and the doctor's out in the back smoking a cigarette. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And uh, we, we still see this sometimes. Respiratory therapists are smoking out on, the, on, the, on their break, and, and nurses used to do this. And, but, time, but times have changed. You don't see this as much. Now, you remember, you're living in Austin, you live in a bubble. I mean, in Austin, you don't see as much smoking. I just got back from Louisiana, which some would say is a different state, some say is a different country. But I was there last weekend, and it was amazing how many people are still smoking cigarettes. It is, it, it, it's, it's, it, everywhere I went, I couldn't walk into a store without somebody smoking cigarettes. And it was, it, so we live in a bubble here. Things are changing, but uh, Austin's changed faster than other places. So just some, uh, some basic statistics about lung cancer. If you have stage three or four lung cancer, the, the survival is terrible. If you, if you, with, uh, it's better than what it used to be, but it's still not good. Uh, if you die to stage one, uh, the survival, though, is, is very good. So we need to try to figure out how to change that stage three and four disease to stage one disease. How do we find these people earlier and get them to treatment earlier? Um, only 16% of lung cancer patients are diagnosed in early stage. So that's what we need to figure out. How do we do that? So you think, well, let's, let's screen for lung cancer. And I can tell you that when you're in your office as primary care providers, you're thinking, well, let's get a chest x-ray. A chest x-ray to screen for lung cancer. 
There is no organization that recommends screening with chest x-rays for lung cancer. It doesn't, do, it doesn't help. It doesn't do any good. So you, you may catch one every now and then, but when you look at the, the big picture, using chest x-rays to screen for lung cancer does not improve survival, does not increase uh, survival whatsoever. So what should be our goals for screening for lung cancer? Well, the goal should be to find those earlier stage cancers so we can then get resected or, or depending on the, 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 what the patient may be, some radiation therapy early uh, to prevent them from getting to be stage 3 and 4 when they're found. So basically it's phase shifting from stage 3 and 4 to stage 1 and maybe 2. Okay, so they, uh, the National Lung Screening Trial looked at low-dose CT scans, looking at uh, trying to find what population of people will benefit from having a CT scan to screen for lung cancer. The, uh, when they finished it, the entire study, they found a 20% relative reduction in mortality in a certain group of people. It's not, it's not all comers. Uh, for the 40-year-old who comes in, you don't get a CT scan of those people. So what we, what we found is that these are the people that should get screened. These are the current recommendations. Age 55 to 74, greater than 30 pack year history of tobacco. That means one pack a year uh, for 30 years or some, some combination of that. A current smoker or somebody quit within the last 15 years, they have to be asymptomatic. If they're not asymptomatic, you're not really doing a screening, a screening CT scan. You're doing a diagnostic CT scan. So these are patients who, who if you want to get these approved for your patient for a screening, low-dose screening CT, they need to be asymptomatic. They have to be, there has to be some documentation of shared decision-making before you order this CT scan. Now, what does that mean? That means that you sit down with your patient and tell them, look, we might find some abnormality on your CT scan. That necessarily means it's going to be cancer, but uh, whenever we find, we're going to have to decide you're going to have to get ongoing CT scans every year for the next 20 years, or we may have to do some biopsy procedure or something based on the results of your CT scan. So there has to be some documentation of a shared decision making with your patient in your chart if you're going to do low dose CT screening CTs. And, and, and really to, to have a screening program, you should have a formal clinic for follow up because there are a lot of things that are going to be found on your CT scan that are not cancer. Most things are not going to be cancer. When you look at all the screening CT scans, only about 4% of these end up being being you find malignant disease on these screening CT scans. So that means the rest of them you're going to find something on there, a little nodule here, atelectasis here, something on there that might need to be followed up. And so you, you need to know where these patients are going to be seen at, where they're going to be followed up, who's going to see that, who's going to do that diagnosis or, or knows what they're looking at afterwards. Um, and, and you can do this in your own clinic if you're a primary care doctor as long as you have some, some setup to, to discuss things with them ahead of time and know where you're going to send them right afterwards when you find an abnormality. So what, what I do when I have a patient who comes to my office and they have a, they've had a, screen, a CT scan or a, a screen CT or an abnormal, abnormal CT scan, and I look at them and say, look, you have a nodule. This may be 8 millimeters, it may be 10 millimeters, maybe 12 millimeters. And they, they want to know, doctor, is it cancer? And I say, well, I can't tell just by looking at your scan. And sometimes I tell people about it. Sometimes I look at scans and say, oh, that's nothing. Sometimes I look at them and say, hmm, I'm kind of worried about that. Sometimes I look at them and say, that's really bad. But, there are, but most of the people fall in that, that range where you really don't know, you don't know what that is. They need, they need more follow-up. They need more uh, evaluation. So you can, you can use these calculators. I like to use a Mayo Clinic calculator. Uh, it uses your age, your history of smoking, how many years you smoked, uh, whether you had prior cancers or not, the size of the, 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 the lesion on your CAT scan, uh, whether it's speculated or not, whether it's upper lobe or not upper lobe. And you can punch all those numbers in. You can easily find it as an app on your phone. You can get to it very easily. And punch those numbers in, and it'll tell you the risk of the risk of uh, malignancy is 10 percent, 15 percent, 45 percent, 75 percent. So I like to tell people, look, your risk of this being malignant based on these these variables is is 20 percent. It's not very high. We can follow this. Or I tell them, look, it's 65, 75 percent. We should do some more evaluation. So people like to know, is it? They want to know is it cancer or not. So this kind of gives us a starting point to jump off from here. So. We found a shadow, what's next? You know, we, I've told them what their relative risk is based on the Mayo Clinic calculator, and not to be cliche, but the tissue is the issue. You need to know, you have to get a piece of it and find out what it is, because you can't just tell uh, by looking at a CAT scan. I, uh, we've all looked at many CAT scans, you look at it and say, ooh, that looks really bad, I think this is cancer, and you biopsy it, nothing shows up, you fall for a while and it goes away, and it wasn't cancer. Or you look at it and you biopsy it, and it turns out it was a uh, histoplasmoma or a coxie or something else. So the tissue is the issue. So the question is, 
how do you get the tissue? You know, who's going to help you get who's going to help you get the tissue there? Well, the radiologist can do a CT guided fine needle biopsy. They do they do plenty of those. They can stick a needle anywhere. They like sticking needles anywhere, and they do a very good job with that. A thoracic surgeon can help you find that. Sometimes if, if someone's at a real high risk and they're a big smoker and they have something that's there, the sometimes the surgeon will say, let's just take this thing out. And and then the pulmonologist can look at you and say, well, we can we can biopsy that by bronchoscopy. Different ways different ways we can biopsy that. We can do I'm going to talk about the navigational bronchoscopies, endobronchial ultrasound biopsies. A lot of different ways we can get at that also. So there are different ways to biopsy lesions. I'm going to tell you why I think that it should run through the pulmonologist now, because I'm on the talker, so I can on the speaker, so I can do that. So many ways to skin a cat: transverse needle biopsies, vats biopsies, bronchoscopy, and even the gastroenterologist will do an endobronchial can do endobronchial ultrasound, and they can do find uh, nodes along the, the esophagus. We don't do EUS very much for for malignancy in Austin, Texas, because our radiologists are good and we do a good job with the bronchoscopy, so we don't send many patients to them to help stage uh, abnormal uh, lymph nodes and, and lung lesions. But in some places, in some parts of the country, they, they do a lot of those. So, history and failure of bronchoscopy in, as a whole. So the, the uh, rigid bronchoscopy was actually, uh, first came into being about 100 years ago. And it's a big rigid solid tube, goes into the airway, you can look at the the main airways, you can put tool, lots of tools through there, but you can't get out to peripheral lesions. You can't put a lot, a lot of other tools down there. You, it's hard to see where you're going. You can't direct where you're going very well. So it's, it was, so for about 60 years, that's all we had. In the 60s, they developed the flexible bronco, bronchoscope. So the flexible bronchoscope, you can, you can go down through the nose, you can go through the mouth, whichever one you want to. It goes in the airway. You can flex up to different lobes. You can, you can look around, it's got, it, and you can, you can buy a few different lesions. Now, the, um, the, the problem with the flexible bronchoscope is that uh, the, the, these peripheral lesions, you, you don't know exactly where you're going to. The air, remember, the airways divide and they divide and they divide. You stick a scope out down there, stick a forceps out there, and it may go this way, it may go that way, and you just never know exactly where that, that forceps is going to. So the, uh, if you look at the data looking at plain bronchoscopy di to biopsy peripheral lesions, uh, your 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 yield is about 15 to six to, to maybe 60 percent, depending on how central that lesion might be. So it's not very good. So when you the bronchoscopy fails, you go to uh, transverse needle uh, biopsy and even surgical biopsies. So what I'm going to talk to you about is not your daddy's bronchoscopy. And actually, this is not even Dr. Deaton's bronchoscopy. This has changed a lot since 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 he first started doing bronchoscopies because. Dr. Deaton, did, did they, they, he grew up with the, the era of, of a bronchoscope. You look down, you see what you're going, what, what you, you biopsy what you see. Well, we biopsy what we don't see now. And there are different ways we use to get there now. These are the endobronchial ultrasound, which will, the, what I refer to as EBUS. Uh, radio probe ultrasound, which is, a, which is a ultrasound that goes way out in the lung, and we can use the ultrasound picture. And then other electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy, which I'll just call E and B from now on. So EBUS and E and B. Okay? So endobronchial ultrasound. So basically, we just have a flexible bronchoscope. This is me holding a flexible bronchoscope. And at the end there, there's a small balloon. That's an ultrasound probe. So we can go down through the airway and, and look at all the, the, the mediastinal lymph nodes. And we can anything just outside the airway. And we can, see the, we can see the lesion and put a needle right into the lesion. And we do an aspirate right there. And we, um, when we do these, we actually hand them right to the pathologist. They look at the microscope and says, yes, you're in the lesion. You have a, you have a diagnosis or no, or no, you don't. Get some more tissue for us. And so we can do that right away. This is what the, uh, what, what, again, there's another picture of the, the end of the scope. It's got a balloon on the end of it, um, a camera on the end of it also. This is the outside, the other end of the scope. And see, we have a, uh, this is attaches to the, to the bronchoscope. And here I can decide how deep I want that my needle to go. So I, I set, set my marks here. I can, I, what we do is we push the needle in, make multiple passes, and that needle, we watch that needle go in and out of the lymph node. And I can adjust it and make it go to different angles. The needles we use have a little, little hook, almost a little hook on the end of them. So as I'm going in, I'm actually getting small, small cords or small bits of tissue uh, from the lymph nodes as I'm going in and doing that. These are the lymph nodes we can get. If we look here, here's the... Can y'all see that there? We'll see it. There's okay. So the trachea is coming down here, divides to the right, right main bronchus, left main bronchus. So all, the, all these lymph nodes along here on the trachea, these are 
we, we number these. There's station 2R, station 4R, uh, station 4L right here. We can bother all those lymph nodes. Station 7, which is subcarinal area. Uh, right as you come to the right main bronchus, this is 10R. This is the right hilum. This is 11R. The same thing on the left side. We can biopsy all these stations with an endobronchial ultrasound, with an EBUS. So we can, st we can, we can look at, so anytime someone comes with me style adenopathy, this is the way we, we can get to them. This is a picture of what it looks like when we're doing the EBUS. Here's a needle, here's a picture of a lymph node. This is all the lymph node here. This is a needle going right into the, right into the lymph nodes. We can watch it go in and out of that. Here's, an, here's another picture I want to show you here because there's a lymph node there. But if you look here, that's a big black hole. That's a big black hole. A big black hole here. Those are not really big black holes. Those are actually blood vessels. So you, so you worry, well, am I going to get a lot of bleeding based on this? Well, let me back up to about 1996 when I first started, or 1995 when I first started doing blind transbronchial needles. We, we didn't know where we were sticking the needles at. We looked at a CAT scan. We saw a lymph node sitting there. So when I'd go down with the bronchoscope, and I'd say, well, I think that node's about right there. And we'd just start sticking needles in. And we stuck them in all over the place. And we realized that people really didn't bleed from those. And so now then, all of, when we got EBUS, and all of a sudden I put down a probe down, and I looked, at, looked there with the, with the ultrasound, I'm like, whoa, look at that. I got a big old vessel right there, and a big old vessel right there. I probably stuck those things a million times. And, uh, but just to show you here, this is a patient who I did, and I, here's a needle coming out right here. There's a tip of it right there. It's in that black hole. And so uh, these patients don't bleed. We actually will do EBUS biopsies with people who are still on anticoagulation too. So we, will anti we, will, we won't stop the laying of coagulation a lot of times when we do the endobronchial ultrasound biopsies. So it's a very safe procedure, one of the safest procedures we do. I tell people the biggest risk of, of this is, is with the anesthesia we use to give you, to, to, to keep you laying there still. We do all these EBUS on, we do ours under general anesthesia. There are some places that do them not under anesthesia, but I, don't, I think that's very difficult to do because we can actually biopsy lymph nodes that are five millimeters in size. So we're we'll, we'll done five millimeters. And the reason that's important is when we look at staging, staging the mediastinum for lung cancer, um, even if a PET scan is negative uh, when, we're, when, we're di when we're staging the mediastinum, we'll biopsy anything five millimeters or larger. And we find out that even PET negative lymph nodes can be, will be positive sometimes on, uh, on EBUS biopsies. So five millimeters or greater. So even if they say, no, no, even if the radiology report says no significant mediastinal adenopathy in the chest, if, I have, if I'm biopsying a lesion in the lung, I'll take an EBUS probe, look for any lymph node I find, and I'll stick all the lymph nodes I see. So here's, a, here's just an example of a patient here. So you have this mass right here. You think, why would you use an EBUS in this patient right here? Well, it, because if you were to biopsy that, and that's all you did, probably you're left with that. And so you don't know, you need to stage somebody too. So we can biopsy this, biopsy that, and stage the mediastinum so you, give them, so you can be done with your procedure and tell the patient, oh, you're a stage, stage 3, stage 4 disease based on your, your lymph node biopsy. So I would actually come here and do a, a, do a, I'd biopsy this thing first. And if that were positive, many times we, would st we might stop there. While we, while we might not stop there, it's because as lung cancer has changed, and the diagnosis of lung cancer has changed, we get more, need more, more material, need more bigger pieces of tissue because they're doing more tests on these things, doing genetic mutation analyses on all, all, all this tissue. So we would go probably and biopsy this too and get bigger pieces of tissue at the same time. So now diagnose them and stage them at one sitting. And those mutation analyses make a difference because it may change what, what chemotherapy they get. So electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. This is what I think is one of the coolest things that I do as a pulmonologist. Uh, I like doing these. So there's a lot of technology involved. And basically, this was uh, it uses GPS technology. That uh, what we do is we use the patient's own airways. Uh, we use a CAT scan. We, we we marry a CAT scan and the patient's own airways and get a virtual airway. And so when we go down in the airway, we can actually the, 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 the path I've used, I've designed to get to a, a lesion, I follow that with my bronchoscope until I can't, use the bron can't see the bronchoscope anymore, until I can't see the air on the airway anymore, and I'll pass a catheter out and follow, they'll still follow a pathway until I get to a particular lesion. And I'll show you that. Um, I actually realized I've doubled, I did that twice, but it's okay. So here's what we do here. So we take a CAT scan. 
So the CAT scan is very important, what, kind, what type of CAT scan we, we use. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking to Austin Radiologic Association and, and the Texas Oncology and people that have CAT scanners that might get CAT scans looking at, at the chest because it's very important. We have to use very thin cut CT scans. We call them Super D protocol. Because the reason we have to do that is because we have to then use that CAT scan, use the information on that CAT scan to plug into our computer to, 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 find, to find the airways that go to and make a pathway to go to the lesion we're going to go biopsy. So we, oh, I'm sorry. So we take the, the, the CAT scan, put it on a disk. I take that disk, I take it to my computer. And my computer has its software here. I load it up in there. And based on that, I can, I then, I take my disk. I look at the computer, I look at the airways, I find my lesion number that I want to go biopsy, I mark it on my uh, screen, that's the lesion I want to biopsy, and then I go back in different, different sections, sagittal, coronal, axial, and I find what air, airways may be going close to that lesion. And then, I, then I, I put little marks there and like little breadcrumbs, and then the computer system then figures all the pathway all the way back up to the trachea. So then I have a pathway. We then take, once I have that pathway, then I actually take a, a USB drive, take it out of the computer, take it over to this little machine over here that's in the room with us, and I plug it into that machine, and then it has a screen on top of it, that then, and I'll show you some pictures of the screen in a minute, that then we use that screen during the, during the procedure. Um, and it helps us guide exactly where we're going to. So we can, so basically we have the software, we plan the, where, how we're going to get there, we use the machine to help us navigate to, to where the lesion we're getting to, we can then biopsy it, biopsy the lesion. We use different ways to biopsy the, these, these lesions too. We put a needle out, a small needle. We put brushes out. We do transbronchial biopsies at that area. The way we do that is we get a catheter. We, we, we put a catheter out, and that catheter, I'll show you in a minute, catheter goes way on the lung, and that catheter is locked in place. So I know my catheter is right where that, that lesion is. We can, I biopsy lesions that have been 8 millimeters in size before and been right there. And so every time I put a, 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 a tool out, it's going right back to that same lesion over and over again. So I get multiple passes with lots of tissue uh, of where the lesion is. And when I get the tissue, I show it to the pathologist, and they, they can look at it and say, yes, you're in the lesion. We have good material here. So I get more, more, uh, more, more passes, and they have more tissue then uh, for, for diagnosis. Now, the last part there says treatment. Now, what kind of treatment can you do with, with all that? Well, right now, the treatment we're talking about is for patients who might be non-operable, uh, have a solitary lesion, we can put out some fiducial markers, which are little gold uh, little markers out there in the lung, and the radiation oncologists use those markers then to give CyberKnife or SBRT high-dose radiation in, in the very selected fields. Because what happens is with the, with the, radiation, with the ra radiation oncologists, their machines cannot track a lesion because they can't see it but they track the markers we put out there. So we put the markers near around the lesion so as the patient breathes, that the machine moves up and down and it gives radiation to that, that lesion based on where those markers are. So I can put the, put the markers out there so I can actually tell a patient, yes, you had, I did the biopsy, you had, you had cancer. We put some markers out there. You're ready to go to the, the radiation oncologist for radiation therapy. Uh, again, this is the way the room, the room is set up similar to this. Um, we're at the head of the bed, we pass our catheters through there, and we're, the whole time we're watching the screen. Uh, we have a locatable guide. So what happens when we put the bronchoscope in the airway, we have a locatable guide that is... Actually, let me go back one. So if you look at this patient right here, on his chest, on the chest they have a white patch there, a white patch there, one there, and there's a board behind there. That sets up the electromagnetic field that tells our guide where we are in the patient. So that's how we know when we're... When we're uh, have the virtual airway and the actual airway, whether we're mirroring what the CAT scan says we should, where we should be going. So if we put a locatable guide out to, we, we, we would navigate out to the lesion, we put the guide there, we take the guide back, put our working channel out there, and put all our tools through the working channel. So this is a picture of what, what actually one of the cases looks like. And to walk you through this, um, these are... Um, this is, this is axial. These are cor coronal. This is the tip of my the tip of my catheter. So the green dot is the actual lesion I marked on the CAT scan when I went on the on the, on the software when I took the CAT scan and put it in the computer. So I mark a green dot, and that then translates to this this screen right here. So that's that's the lesion right there. 
And here's the tip of my catheter. I can tell, tip of my catheter, I'm right at the green dot. If you look at this, this screen way over here to the right, this is normal lung here. That little lead right there, that's actually what the lesion looks like on our screen when we're looking at it. So I, I actually see an abnormal area on the, on the screen when I'm looking at it. This uh, screen over here is, doesn't project real well, I'm sorry, but there's a blue line that comes out of the end of my, at the end of my guide there that, that I know if I put a tool out directly through the end of my catheter, that's going to follow that blue line. So that's where it's going to go. So I'll try to line that blue line up right through this, this lesion, and that's how I know that I'm heading in the right direction there. So you might ask, do you trust that green dot? I mean, it's just a green dot out there. How do you know you're really there if you see the green dot? Well, we use radio probe EBUS. So the other EBUS I showed you was uh, uh, linear EBUS, which is, helps us look at the mediastinum. This is a EBUS probe right here. It's real thin. It's about that thin right there. And it actually goes out into the, we put it through the end of our working channel. And when I put it at the end of my working channel, we, we turn that ultrasound on, and it can tell me if there is a mass right there. Here's what we're, what we're looking at right here. This is, uh, this here is, I'm right there at the mass. That's what I'm looking at. When I see that, I know that my, the end of my channel, working channel, is right there at the mass. So we use this to confirm what the green dot tells us. So you say, what's a, what's a good, uh, what's a good cat scan have to look at, uh, look like to, to know that this would be a good patient for you to do a navigation on? Well, this is called the bronchus sign. When you have an airway that goes like that right into a mass, that's, that's, a, that's an easy one because there's a big old airway going right to it and so we can get to that. Um, here's right here. It says, can you get to that? You see the end of my catheter. See the scope stops right here. I've directed a catheter out here, twisted it around, and it's sitting right out here in the periphery. Um, so that was a positive diagnosis right there without a pneumothorax. Um, but can you get that? And the answer is yes. That was a guy that came into my office. He was a smoker. He had that thing that had gotten over a period of a, a year or two. It got a little bit bigger, a little more dense. So we biopsied that. That turned out to be an adenocarcinoma. It was resected, and he's doing great. And you might, your question might be, well, yeah, can you get at that? But why would you get at that? Why would you even try to get at that? And then it goes back to phase shifting. We're trying to find people that have small, stage 1 cancers that can be treated, and this is exactly why we're, what we're trying to get to. People with stage 1 cancers that can be treated early. The other question you might have is, well, you know, that's, or like even for the one right before this, that's pretty far out there. Why would you even try to biopsy that with a, bronchos with a bronchoscope? Why would you try to biopsy that with a bronchoscope? Why not use, have a transthoracic needle biopsy? And it all goes back to staging the mediastinum also. So we want to know, make sure we're going we're gonna to look at the lymph nodes in the mediastinum uh, with the EBUS and, and, and biopsy anything in the mediastinum too so we can say, yes, this patient has nothing in the mediastinum, only has one peripheral lesion, therefore they can get resected. We call that one-stop shopping. Mm -hmm. So you come here, so you don't have to have, have a biopsy done, done down this one out here, and they have to go get something else done, but then they have to be sent to us later on for an EBUS to proceed to mediastinum. We can do them both at the same, at the same sitting. So what else can we do with, uh, uh, besides just biopsy and lesions? Well, we work with the radiation oncologists very closely, because this is what I'm talking about, the fiducials. When we go out there, we actually, uh, this is our green dot, and you can see these little red marks here. This is where... We, we put out markers around in three dimensions around these lesions. So they, all, they have to be within five centimeters of the, of the lesion. We put uh, three markers out there in different dimensions so that the, uh, the, radio, the machines they use can contract those, mark, can contract those uh, markers to give that patient radiation therapy. So what else can you do with this? Pleural dye tattoo marking. So this is actually... A uh, patient who the thoracic surgeon wanted to go, there was, a, there was an area that was abnormal, it was kind of nodular, it wasn't real, he didn't think that he could go in there with the bats and feel anything exactly, so he asked me to go and put some dye out there. So this is what you're looking at right here. This is the inside of the chest wall right here. This is the lung deflated. These are his graspers right here. Um, I'm just sort of just probably laughed at me, they're not graspers, but anyway, these are, uh, this is what, this forceps here. So basically, uh, when, he, when the lung falls down, he knows that's the area right there where he needs to go, he needs to go uh, biopsy that, take that part out right there. And so he lets the lung down, finds the spot very quickly, takes it out, he knows he has his, the piece of tissue he needs. So there's a, 
Education, elevation, coordination. This is a coordination part of it. But we're talking about how are we going to make cancer care better in our community? And everybody, there are multiple different cancer conferences for GI, for, for breast. Well, we've started doing cancer conferences for lung also. And, the, and our goal is, is to discuss not more than 90% of the cases at cancer conference. And the reason, the reason being is that uh, there are a lot of different ways to treat people. And we need to, we're trying to come up with the common pathways that most that try to, try to use data-driven pathways so we know that everybody's getting the most appropriate care they should be getting. So we have our cancer conference, we have pathology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, radiologists are there, we're there, thoracic surgeons are there. We can have an open discussion about what's the best way to, to go after these lesions, what's the best way to treat these lesions once we get them. Uh, we would like at some point, we have these once a month here right now, we'd like to get to the point where we can actually present patients maybe even before we, before we biopsy them so we know what the most appropriate way to biopsy these patients are and set them up for their, their therapy afterwards. What I do generally right now is if I see a patient, I'll call, if I'll, I'll, do, I'll do PFTs in my office, I will look at this and say, hmm, this patient's got pretty bad lung function. I doubt they're going to be a, patient, a candidate for, for a thoracic surgery. They may be a candidate for radiation therapy. I'll call the, the radiation oncologist and say, look, I have this patient. I'm going to do this, do this biopsy. Do you want to put fiducials there? Do you not? What are you going to do? So we talk about some of those independently right now, but our goal is to discuss more of these cases at a conference so that everybody understands what everybody else can do. Because many of the many, when we first started having these conferences, they didn't know that this, this, this was out there, that we could do navigation and EBUS and what we could sample, what we can't sample. And so, these, so the whole thing is to improve the herd knowledge. Everybody, know, everybody learns a little bit every time we start talking about a case. We all say, well, I didn't think a third surgeon could get to that. Well, I didn't know the radiologist could get to that. I didn't know that the, 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 this, this therapy is out there. So anyway, that's the idea of our multi multidisciplinary cancer conferences to overall increase, increase knowledge and improve better patient care. So I'm gonna, we're going to wind this up a little bit. I want to go back about EBUS versus ENB. People always tell me, I, I have a patient for, for EBUS for you. Well, Tell you, let me tell you why each one, why you would use one over the other. The EBUS is for central lesions. If you have hyalur, mediastinal hyalur adenopathy, those are great cases for EBUS because they're easy to get to. We see them, we put a needle into them. Peripheral lesions, we get the, we use navigational bronchoscopy for those. Uh, that's that's what that's what that was required. Mediastinoscopy, we basically, if you talk to the thoracic surgeon, you'll find out that they hardly do any mediastinoscopies anymore because we do EBUS now, and the EBUS has been shown to be as good as as a uh, mediastinoscopy in in the people in people who do a lot of this, so it's just as good. And uh, we will stage the mediastinum for the surgeon something before surgery. Now, when they get in, if they end up doing a, a resection for a stage one cancer, they'll go resect nodes too to uh, to make sure. But they'll this they'll, they'll, know, they'll know there's nothing positive going in, and, and they'll, they'll but they'll do that. But we we the EBUS supplant has basically supplanted mediastinoscopy for most patients. Um, the, the limitation with EBUS in, in, in is lymphoma, mediastinal lymphoma. If you have a high suspicion for mediastinal lymphoma, oftentimes we don't get enough tissue for that. Uh, with flow cytometry, it's, it's helpful, but if you need a big core of tissue, then sometimes we don't get a big enough piece with, with the EBUS. So if you're thinking about lymphoma, then we, you know, we can still help you evaluate that, but they may need to have mediastinoscopy in, in that group of patients. So staging. Uh, these, these are these these are complementary uh, complementary activities. We can do the stage of mediastinum and bi sorry and biopsy the peripheral lesions with with these with these uh, modalities. Placement of fiducials, we do that with navigation. Diet tattoo marking, we do that with navigation. So some takeaway points. So again, I just mentioned that EBUS is as good as mediastinoscopy to evaluate the mediastinum. Uh, EBUS is safe and effective, E and B navigation is an effective, effective way to sample peripheral uh, nodules even in high risk patients. I routinely biopsy patients with awful emphysema and the fact that I'm right there next to these lesions and I'm putting, I'm putting, I'm putting a brush and a biopsy right there, I'm not going through lots of lung tissue, I'm not going across the pleura, so the risk of pneumothorax is lower. Um, so it, it, it is a way to get to those patients. Um, e and B allows for preparation for treatment, for High-risk patients, biopsy, place fiducials, get them ready to go to the, radi the radiation oncologist. They're complementary technologies. The big thing, one of the big things is it's really important now to get adequate tissue acquisition. 
The, the, the oncologists need this tissue. The pathologists need lots of tissue to do all their special stains, uh, to do all their genetic tumor analysis, and that's becoming more and more important as we go forward. And basically, um, we can do one-stop one shopping. With the EBUS and navigation, we can diagnose, stage, and even start to prepare them for therapy. So what does the future hold? I'm very excited about this. I think this is exciting for us. For a long time, there wasn't a whole lot new in pulmonary medicine. Uh, we uh, you know, gave people inhalers. We gave people theophylline. Then we didn't give them theophylline. Then we gave it again, and we didn't give it again. So you know, things have changed. They're changing for us. We're able to do more things, more things in the periphery, more things in the lung, and I think it's very exciting. We can assist radiation oncologists, thoracic surgeons with tattoo marking, with fiducials. There are new therapeutics coming out. There are, things are changing rapidly. At some point in time, they, there's talk in the next five, ten years of maybe doing some localized radiofrequency ablation in the lung at one year there at the lesion. Um, I'm not sure what's going to come of that. Um, there are some other things that are, that are occurring, though, that even uh, when you look at a, a biopsy, say I do a biopsy and I have a non-diagnostic biopsy for a lung nodule. Well, you can get some for bronchial genomic classifiers. You just scrape the, scrape the lining of the airway send it off to a company, and they'll tell you, well, you know, based on, uh, based on this, there's a high percentage that you just got a non diet that you have a false negative, and you need to do more testing. Or based on this, this is probably a true negative, and you don't need to do any more testing. You can just follow this. So there are some things that are coming out there. There are breath tests that you read about to help diagnose lung cancer, blood tests for looking for genetic tumor, uh, 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 genetic uh, mutation analysis markers. So a lot of things happening here in, uh, in pulmonary medicine. I think with that, time to go fishing. <laughs>and as you go down, if you see that you're off the line, then you have to back up and, and turn your catheters. You know, the catheters have like a 180 degree turn on them or 90 degree turn, depending on where we think we're going. So as we're going down, if you see that you're off the line, you just back up and twist it a little bit and you'll see the line again and you keep going and keep twisting around. You know, we don't have to have that bronchus sign that I showed you, the airway going to a lesion to get to a, to get to a, a mass. Uh, you don't have to have that. that. Those are really nice, but you don't have them, you can still get to a lesion. Yes, ma'am. How long does it take to do one? Uh, good question. So I just, I can tell you, right before I came to this, this talk, I did a uh, patient, and I did, I uh, went in, I uh, biopsied him, um, got an answer for a diagnosis, put fiducial markers in there. We were done in about 45 to 50 minutes. Sometimes they take longer. Our group has done something where we decided, that we have 13 members in our group, we decided that not everybody was going to do everything halfway. So we've had just a few of us who are doing this. So the few of us who are doing this have gotten very fast at it. If you had... If we had 13 of us doing this, it would take a long time. Sometimes they take, it can take an hour and a half, two hours in some places. But we've gotten pretty good at it because we do a lot of them. Yes? How do you, how do you make sure you say that this is good to find the biopsy versus the biopsy that would be done by you? Or preferably? Okay. So, so that's a good question. There's still, we have not finished working all that out yet because if someone has a lesion sitting right up against the pleura and you look at it and the mediastinum otherwise looks clear and it looks like they're pretty, hard, pretty healthy, yeah, probably, or whatever reason, for whatever reason, I might just tell you, I send those to a radiologist and say, just put a needle in that. If there's a patient who's got a, a nodule sitting up against the aorta or sitting real centrally, they don't want to go anywhere near that. And so, they'll, so we'll, we'll biopsy those. If there's a concern that there may be some mediastinal adenopathy also, then, and, and a peripheral nodule, I'll biopsy the peripheral nodule and do the EBUS to help stage them at the same time. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you get a peripheral a needle biopsy, and it comes back as cancer. They say, well, are they resectable or not? Well, now go stage the mediastinum. And sometimes the surgeon will say, oh, I'll just do it. I'll just go ahead and uh, do a mediastinoscopy at the time of the resection. But a lot of times they'll send them to us anyway for an EBUS. So then you have a needle biopsy, and then you have an EBUS anyway. So and there are times where we'll say, well, we just can't get to, we just can't get. Sometimes you just can't get to a lesion. But there are new tools that come out. So they're coming out. One's called a cross-country tool where you can actually go and get close to it. You see you can't quite get to it, and you can actually make a little puncture in the lung and get to it and follow up, a little catheter and follow and get out there. We haven't done that. We've only done about 40 cases like that in the country. We're going to be getting that catheter pretty soon, so we may be doing some of those. Yes, sir? Any limitations by patient size? If you have small, small patients or 
or a big patient? No. The only limitation is whether they can get a CAT scan or not. If they're big, if they're, if they're small enough to fit in the CAT scanner and they have a CAT scan, then we can we can do this. No, we don't do kids. I don't do kids. I don't do anybody. I've, I've, I don't do anybody less. Well, most people, most kids are not going to have little nods like that and they have some cancer. But we don't. We don't do kids. I don't. I've, I don't bonk anybody less than 16 years old. Is there anything either current or on the horizon to kind of basically characterize nodules to determine if they're likely? Yeah, that's what we're just ta talking about. They're they're not they're. There are these breath tests that are coming out where you can breath and see if they have. Uh, uh, they're, they're, I don't know how they work yet because they're still they're still pretty, pretty far out there. But there's really nothing. You know, there's, I there's MRI related or radiological. I don't think so. Not MRI related. But with PET, you know, PET scans are used to help to help determine if there's glucose uptake in a, in a lesion whether the lesion's active. But just because it's active does not tell you that it's cancer or not. There are a lot of lesions that are PET positive. They're not cancer. So that's why anytime there's a pet positive, you know, pet positivity, it says, yeah, there's something going on there. It may lead us to biopsy versus I mean, to, to, go, to go something more. Just because if it's pet negative, well, then we, we watch we watch them. But even mediastinal lymph nodes can be pet negative and have tumor. Anybody else? Thank you very much. <laughs>